as far as life groups. I consider my life a family. I mean, I've been in church ever, ever since I can remember, and I never felt this close to a group that I was ever in than I do here. Church family, good morning. We're so excited to be able to worship our King today, Palm Sunday. Can't believe it's Palm Sunday already. The next week is Easter. We're excited to be able to worship our King together today. And there's some amazing stories that have been going on around our campus and the school of what God is doing. And you just saw a teaser for a story that's going on down in Griffin. Some of you may not even know, if you're new to our church, we have a Griffin campus, an amazing team down there and a church family, an extension of what's going on here. And so you can go online and hear about some awesome stuff that's going on there in a life group down there. And so make sure that, try not to do it during the message today, if you don't mind, you know, going online. But maybe when you get home today, go online and check out that amazing story, what's going on in a life group down there. And for now, we're gonna jump up and we're gonna spend some time worshiping together today. Our King, I want you to sing out, sing through all the pollen, everything else. He's worthy today, let's work. We wanna know and follow him wherever he leads us. I see the love of the Father. The sacrifice of his son And I feel the pull of the spirit Gotta tell someone I see your people rejoicing At Eagles Landing From every nation and tongue I hear the song of salvation, I gotta tell someone. Wherever you lead me, Lord, I'll go. I'll take up my cross and I will follow. Whenever you say the word, I'll live. I'll go wherever. No matter the cost, you were. All. No matter the place, no matter how far, wherever you leave me, Lord, I'll go, I'll go wherever, I'll go wherever. I see your people rejoicing from every nation. song of salvation gotta tell someone oh wherever you leave me lord i'll go take up my cross and i will follow whatever you say the word out there i'll go wherever no matter the cost you worth it all
and I will follow Whenever you say the word of Lord, I'll go family, I want you to stay standing. We want to celebrate with one who's being baptized today. Can you guys give them a big hand and celebrate with them today? All right. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, church. Um, this is Dylan Lloyd. And um, Dylan is one of our ninth grade guys. I, I love all of our students here, obviously, but our ninth grade guys have a special place in my heart because I teach ninth grade guys life group every single Sunday morning. And so, Dylan, I've gotten to know him over the last uh, year almost, and um, uh, we, we've just been seeing God move in our student ministry. It's been really amazing and really encouraging. Uh, but a few weeks ago, I was preaching on a Wednesday night and got to the, the gospel invitation, and um, I asked for students that were making a decision to, to look at me, and Dylan looked at me, and I looked at him and said, do you mean that? Are you serious? And uh, he said, yes. Uh, he responded that night to the gospel. Uh, over the last few weeks, he's had conversations with his with his parents, and they've confirmed that. And it's just uh, it's something special when you ask a student, "Are you serious about Jesus?" and they say yes. Um, and now, because of that, because of that, we're getting ready to baptize you, buddy. And so, let me ask you, ma'am, who do you profess to be your saving king? Jesus Christ. Because of that confession. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? Let's pray together, church family. God, you are doing amazing things. From the youngest to the oldest in our church family, God, we are hearing amazing things about how God is at work. And Lord, to be able to follow you, to know and to follow you is so amazing. How you love us, how you draw us into your kingdom, to your family, to the beautiful story that you are telling. It is amazing, it is humbling, it is an honor, it is a joy. God, sometimes we can get so busy in our lives that we forget how amazing this God is that we follow. And so God, today, as we gather as a church family and we spend time in worship, I pray God that you'll open our eyes a little bit wider, open the eyes of our heart to be able to be reminded today of your holiness, your greatness, your power, your sovereignty, to be reminded of just how amazing you really are and that we would walk out of here trusting you more, that we would walk out of here more passionate for the things that you care about than ever before in our lives, that the things that we value won't be things of this world, things of the flesh, but that we will value the things that you value, that we'll have a different set, things that we value that we'll see your worth and then everything else will fall into place underneath that. So God, today, please help us to trust you and wanna know you more. And God, if there's those in this room that don't know you, I pray you'll open their hearts to who you are. We want them to know the gospel, God, that is so powerful and how it changed our lives. We pray you would move in a powerful way in this time that we have together today. We don't wanna play church and play games and go through routines today, God. We want to know you. Because only you can save, only you can change lives. Only you hold truth and wisdom and life in your hands. 
And so we turn our hearts and our affections to you. Only you can love us. Only through you can we know what love really is. And today we turn towards you, God, because we need you. We need you more than we want to admit, more than we realize, more than we know. So God, today, with all the other things in the world trying to draw our attention and affections, we turn our hearts and eyes and lives towards you. In Jesus' name.
family, y'all can have a seat. You know, one of the reasons I love Sundays is when we gather for corporate worship, our minds are drawn upward to look and fix our gaze on God. I don't know if you've noticed this morning, but we have sung already about the God who sends us out to make him known. We've sung about the God who has saved us and is a constant shelter for us. And we just sang about our sovereign God who reigns and rules over all. And that same God who is sovereign and reigns and rules over all knows about everything that is going on in your life, ways you need him to show up, ways that uh, you're calling out to him now. And as we move into this time of giving, I want us to remember that this is the same God that whenever we, uh, whenever we give and whenever we are faithful in giving, this is something that God honors, that he uses the gifts and the tithes and offerings of his people to make his name known, to provide for the saints and a host of other ways uh, to make his name known in the world. So as we begin our giving time, let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. Lord, each one of the songs we just sang reminds us of an incredible truth. Lord, you have saved us through Jesus alone. You provide us a constant shelter, a refuge in time of need. You are our only hope. And Lord, you reign and rule over all. And there are so many things in life that distract us and get us focused on the wrong things. We 
came in here today maybe with a bunch of worries, a bunch of concerns. Lord, I pray that through our worship and through the preaching that happens today, Lord, we'd be reminded, Lord, you know where we are. You see us and you are with us through everything. And Lord, as we give today, Lord, I pray that through our gifts and our faithfulness there, Lord, that you would be made known to our neighbors and to the nations. That we would extend the hope, the one true hope that exists for humanity. And that's the gospel, the salvation that's found in Jesus Christ. So we give all this to you in Christ and we pray. Amen. So I want to let you know something that's coming up. Um, if you are a guest with us or you've been attending for a while but haven't yet joined the Eagles Landing family, on Sunday, April 14th at 5 p.m., we're going to have our next Discover class. At this Discover class, you'll have an opportunity to interact with the staff. It's an interactive environment. You'll hear about the mission, the vision, the values of the church, where we're headed, things that have happened in the past, and what we're hoping to see happen in the future. But you'll also have a chance to, to meet our staff and engage with others who are on this same journey. So you'll have an opportunity to join what God is doing here at Eagles Landing. And that's again, Sunday, April 14th at 5 p.m. in Life Center room 106. And you can register on the app or online, or you can stop at the next steps table on your way out uh, to register for that class. Also, as we're in the middle of where we're beginning Holy Week as we head toward Easter, I wanna let you know about two things that are really exciting that are coming up. First is this Friday, our Good Friday service at 6.30 p.m. out on the front lawn here in front of the church. We're gonna have worship, sharing communion together as we remember what all Christ's death has accomplished for us and for those that come to Christ. We cannot forget the cross in all in all that we say and all that we do, we cannot lose the centrality of the cross and how vital it is and how central it is to our salvation and to our life in Christ. So we're gonna celebrate the cross on Friday and then on Sunday morning, we're gonna celebrate the resurrection together with life groups at 9.30 a.m. and then one big worship gathering at 11. So we hope to see you there. But in the meantime, let's stand together and continue to praise our sovereign God.
time together to be brothers and sisters gathered together to just encourage one another and grow closer to you or closer to each other but I have no doubt there are plenty of us that still feel my guilt is great my guilt and my shame is wide everything that we struggle with is in this current condition but God we know that you are ever present and that is can become it doesn't can it does become a was in you we are made whole we are made complete we are made holy because of the blood of Christ and it is complete this morning Lord we pray that we would rest in that completeness rest in the sufficiency of Christ not in our works not in our striving not in our struggle but in Jesus Lord, would you open our hearts, open our minds, and our eyes, and our ears this morning to receive the word, and may it grow and flourish in our hearts. God, we love you, and thank you so much that we get to be together. In your name we pray. Amen. In 2011, I had the privilege of being the football chaplain for both Valdosta State University and for Valdosta High School. Um, Valdosta High School is a unique place, really, in my heart because it was the first time that I had ever served as a high school football chaplain. And if you know anything about Valdosta High School, uh, that you, then you know that they are the nation's winningest high school football program. Um, in 40, uh, they've actually had 42 regional championships. They've had 24 state championships, and they've had six national championships. In the year 2008, ESPN polled the whole world, or whole United States at least, and they named one city in all of America, Titletown, USA. And they named that city Valdosta, Georgia. Large in part because of the success of Valdosta High School's football team. Valdosta High School had two legendary coaches. One, his name was Coach Wright Baysmore. The other coach was named Coach Nick Hyder. Baysmore and Hyder, which is what their football stadium is called to this day, Baysmore and Hyder not only loved those kids and invested good football skills and knowledge into the lives of those kids, but Baysmore and Hyder loved Jesus. Baysmore and Hyder both fought for the child's heart. 
They believe that if there is one thing that they are set to accomplish, that is to use their platform to lead young athletes to Jesus, to point people to Christ each and every day. To this day, Nick uh, Hyder is actually was inducted into the FCA Hall of Champions in Kansas City, Missouri, large in part because not only was he like a two- or three-time coach of the year, nationally speaking, but also because of his tremendous faith and his investment into the lives of young kids um, through the platform that God get, has given him as a coach. But if you know anything about this story, one thing that you'll know is Coach Baysmore started a phrase that to this day runs as a tradition at Valdosta High School. He said to his team at halftime, he said to his team in pregame speech, and he even said to his team after victory, one thing we don't do at Valdosta is we never, 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 never quit. We never, 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 never quit. Baysmore started that tradition. Hyder would continue it. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it's even being used to this very day. You know, when we come to the end of First Timothy, this is the same message that Paul has given Timothy. As Paul is saying to young Timothy, listen, I know things are going to get tough, and I know things are going to get hard, but there's one message that I need to say to you here at the end of chapter 6 before I close this letter, and that is this, never, 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 never quit. There are going to be men and there are going to be women who punch you in the face, but you're going to have to get back up. There are going to be people who knock you down, but you're going to have to get back up. But one thing's emphatically true, young Timothy. In this life and in this battle that you are facing, you are to never, 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 never quit. That message that Coach Baysmore and Coach Hyder gave to Valdosta High is the same message that Paul is delivering here to young Timothy on how to have a healthy church. You want your church to be healthy? Then your church has to be composed of individuals who love Jesus, and even when the going gets tough, they don't quit. They don't bow down. If they get knocked down, they get back up. If they get slapped in the face, they fight back, and they fight back with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where we're headed today in our time Together. In fact, if I could summarize our time together in one sentence, it would be this. Healthy churches never quit fighting for the faith. Healthy churches never quit fighting for the faith. When you think about the life of a Christian, the life of a child of God is a battle. It's a battle. The moment you say a prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the moment you surrender your life to the Lordship of Christ, you are stepping into a ring. And when you step into that ring, you better believe the enemy is going to throw some blows. you got to be ready to take it, you got to be ready to fight back, and you got to know that your only weapon is the Word of God. That's what we're entering into as children of God. We are entering into a fight. We are entering into a battle, and that is the imagery that you're going to see here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Healthy churches never quit fighting for the faith. Healthy churches and healthy Christians, they never quit. In fact, they wage war, but they don't wage war against each other. They wage war against sin. They don't only fight, they don't fight each other, they fight against sin. They pursue the heart of God, and they don't stop fighting, they don't stop, they don't start, stop, they don't quit until the final whistle has blown. That was Baysmore, that was Hyder's message to his team. You guys have heard it. It was a phrase coined in 1978. It's not used as much today. But the opera's not over until the fat lady sings. That got changed because it was a sports writer who actually came up with that phrase to where the game is not over until the fat lady sings. Baysmore and Hyder would say, hey, until the clock strikes zero, the game's not done. Until the final whistle is blown, until the final horn sounds, the game is not over, so you never, 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 never quit. And I believe this morning God is saying the same thing to the church. That there is going to be a horn that sounds, and it's a trumpet from heaven, and when Jesus returns, that's when the game ends, and we're to never, 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 never quit until that final whistle is blown. 
therefore, exhortations, I want to show you in this text of Scripture this morning that I believe if you will heed these things, they will really encourage your heart. I think that Timothy is, or Paul is wrapping up this letter to Timothy in a rather strange way, but a rather unique way, because I also think that the words that he's saying to Timothy are supposed to be also said to us, and if we'll heed them, I truly believe that not only we as a church will be more healthy, but we as Christians would be more healthy as well. Four exhortations, the first one is this. The first thing he says to young Timothy is flee. It's that simple. Flee. Look at verse 11 of chapter 6. He says, but as for you, O man of God. (laughs) I love that phrase. That phrase, O man of God, is actually an Old Testament phrase. It's only used twice in the New Testament, but it's only used once in the New New Testament in reference to a, a particular person. And it's used here in reference to Timothy. He says, O man of God, that was a title that was given to Moses. That was a title that was given to Elijah and Elisha and Samuel and David. And now all of a sudden, the only time the New Testament uses it, it's used in reference to Timothy. That is a beautiful group of people to belong to. And Paul is saying, O you man of God, flee. That means run away from these things. What things, Paul? Paul, if you're going to tell me to run away from these things, you got to let me know what these things are. Paul is referring to the things that we talked about in verses 3 through 10, the text that preceded this one. Things like materialism. Paul is saying to Timothy, you have to flee the love of money. You have to flee materialism. You have to flee arrogance. And you have to flee pride. And you have to run away from slander. You have to run away from quarrels that are among you as the men and the women of God. Paul says, flee these things. Why is Paul saying this? The reason Paul is saying this is because he's trying to draw a distinction between the culture uh, culture of the church that the false teachers are trying to create and the culture of the church that the gospel wants to create. In other words, what he's saying is, hey church, if you want to be healthy and if you are healthy, you should look polar opposite than the world. But like you shouldn't see the values of the world infiltrate the doors of the church. Like you should stand in complete contrast to the ways of the world. So he's reminding Timothy, and really he's reminding us this morning, that we're not to be like the world. You know, when you think about this word fleeing, fleeing can be a sign of weakness, but fleeing can also be a sign of wisdom. Think about that. Fleeing can be a sign of weakness. But fleeing can be a sign of wisdom. How, how, how might fleeing be a sign of weakness? You remember when, I guess it was in Exodus chapter 3, when Pharaoh, or Moses, was called by God to go take this message to Pharaoh to let God's people go. They were in Egyptian slavery. You remember the story there? And from Exodus chapter 3 to Exodus chapter 6, Moses gives at least eight different excuses as to why he should not go before Pharaoh. That's fleeing in the face of a weakness, like Instead of fearing God, he feared man. That's fleeing in weakness, okay? What about Moses once he finally got over that hurdle and he starts leading God's people? Moses is a leader. He, he feared men. We as leaders do. And okay, now he has a people of God and he's taking them to the promised land. You remember the story? They're out of slavery. The Egyptians are trying to chase them down to slaughter them, to kill them. And they get to the Red Sea. And all of a sudden, their backs are against the Red Sea and they look up on the mountain and this whole slew of Egyptian army is coming down upon them. And what do the people of God start to do? Moses, let's just go back to Egypt. Life was better there than it is here. We're going to die here. Moses, how dare you take us out of Egypt? Why would you bring us here for this to happen to us? We should have just stayed where we were, Moses. This is your fault. You're the one who brought us here. You're delivering us into the hands of the Egyptians. Now we're going to be dead. We could have just stayed serving them. What did they start to do? They wanted to flee. They wanted to flee as a moment of weakness. See, fleeing can be weakness. What happens in the book of Nehemiah? Many of you know the story of Nehemiah, God's people. Nehemiah gets this burden in his heart. I want to go rebuild the walls of God's city. And he's going to go back. He's going to rebuild the walls of God's city. And while he's doing it, all the, the, the whole time, God's people are grumbling and they're complaining. It's too hot out here. We shouldn't do this. The enemies are attacking. And Nehemiah has to say to them, you, you can run, but life's not going to get better for you. Or you can stay here and do the work that God's called us to do. They want to flee as a sign of weakness. But fleeing is not only a sign of weakness, it also can be a sign of wisdom. You remember when 
Joseph was seduced by Potiphar's wife. The Bible says that Joseph fled. Not only did he flee, but there was some physical force that he had to use because some of his cloak was stripped out of, off of him and into her hand when he got away. That's fleeing in the face of wisdom. What about David? When Saul wanted David dead, we talked about this last year, what happened in that story? David went into the wilderness to flee, not because he was particularly just scared of Saul, but because in wisdom he said, hey, this is where it's safest for me during this season of time, knowing that God would begin a work, hopefully in Saul's heart. And he goes out there, he writes, and he prays, and he does the work of the Lord while he's in the wilderness. He flees out of wisdom. So see, some fleeing is out of weakness, and some fleeing is out of wisdom. I love how the late Warren Wearsby says this. Not all unity is good. And not all division is bad. Why would Warren Wearsby say that? That not all unity is good and not all division is bad. Here's why. Because if you've ever been around a group of gossipers, they're the most united people on the planet. Remember that phrase I gave you out of the movie Wicked? Hey, if you want to unite a people, just give them a common enemy. Hey, put the target on the preacher's back and we can all unite the church. Put, put the target on that girl's back and we can unite as a band of brothers and sisters and start talking about her. They are united, but that's not a good unity at all. He says not all unity is good, and then he says, but also not all division is bad. We are called as children of God to be separate from the world. That means to be divided from the world. That is a good sense and source of division. Paul is easily saying, or saying, it's easy to unite around godless practices, but separation or division from godless practices and empty religion, that's actually a good thing. Why is it good, Paul? Why do you think that separation from godless practices is actually a good thing? What if we lose our voice into the lives of those people that we're trying to reach? Paul says, because it preserves the unity and the purity of the church. That's why it's good. And we have to fight for that. We have to go to war for that. We have to go to battle for that. So Paul says, flee. Flee from false teaching. Flee from the love of money. Flee from arrogance. Flee from greed. Flee from slander. Free, flee from deceit. These are the very things, Paul says, that are pulling the Christian's hearts away from God. These are the things that are infiltrating the church and causing the church to wonder if they're really doing the right thing. In fact, these things were being distractions to the mission of God. And Paul says to his church, we've got to correct that. We've got to flee godless practices. But he doesn't leave us there. That's the beauty of Paul. He doesn't just leave us to wonder if we're going to flee. Where do we go and what do we do? He gives us a second exhortation. He says it's not enough just to flee. Second, you have to pursue. You have to pursue. Look at verse 11 again. He says, but as for you, O man of God, flee. That means run away from these things. And then he says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Paul says fleeing is not enough because once you flee, the natural disposition of a human heart is when we separate ourselves from sin, because we're sinners, we just start to, we just start to connect ourselves to more sin. It's just a different sin. And Paul says we have to pursue the right things. So what is he actually saying? He's saying separate ourselves from sin and wickedness. That's a good thing. But then he says we also have to consecrate ourselves to God. He says it's not enough just to detach yourselves from sin and wickedness. He says when you detach yourself from sin and wickedness, you're now created to attach yourself to the person of Jesus Christ. Separation, you got to get this church, separation without consecration leads to isolation. Separation without consecration leads to isolation. You remember the false teachers were actually teaching a gospel that was Jesus plus something else is what really brought us salvation. It was a legalistic gospel saying, hey, we had to do certain things and not do other things. And if we did those things and didn't do these things, then we would earn good standing and good favor with God. All of a sudden, God would accept us and approve of us because we're acting right and doing right and not doing the things that we're not supposed to do. As if Jesus alone wasn't sufficient enough for them. It was Jesus plus something else that they were able to do 
that led to their salvation. You do understand that the doctrine of legalism is a doctrine of isolation. And you might be thinking, well, that doesn't make sense. How is it isolation if I'm practicing legalism with a group of people? Listen, a group of people without God is the most isolated thing that you can ever experience. A group of people with God, that's true community. That's true biblical fellowship. And what Paul was saying is, hey, if you detach yourself from wickedness and sin and you don't attach yourself to God, you're getting it wrong. That's a miserable place to be. So he's encouraging us, hey, not only do you need to flee from sin, but you have to pursue the right things. What are the right things, Paul? He says this first. He says we are to pursue first righteousness. That's just right living. It's right thinking that results in right living. It's another word for it's integrity that you become the same person in private that you are in public. He says, pursue that kind of guy. Not only does he say righteousness, but he says, pursue godliness. See, godly beliefs we're supposed to pursue. And godly beliefs will result in godly behaviors. You don't have to work hard. Just, Just allow your heart to be shaped and molded to the person of Christ, and it will take care of the behaviors. Godly character, as you pursue it, will result in godly conduct. And he says you need to pursue that simple way of saying it for us simple people is just be obedient to the word of God. Just obey. Say yes to Jesus. We pursue righteousness and godliness, but third, he says faith. What does that mean? It means seek a deeper understanding of who God is and what God wants to do in your life. Become fully dependent on him. And then he says, fourth, love. Pursue love. That means to pursue a greater affection both for God and a greater affection for people. Pursue that. In fact, it's a love that seeks to give, not gain. It's that word agape. It's the love that says, hey, I'm I'm not going to get something out of this. I'm going so that I might be able to give something to this. I was in a conversation with one of my friends who has been really struggling in his church. Maybe you're like this in here, but he's been really struggling in, in his church, and he was sharing with me, you know, I just don't know if God's trying to uproot us and move us somewhere else. And I pushed back against that, and I said, why do you think he might be trying to move you somewhere else? And he said, man, I just don't feel like I'm growing. And maybe you are here, and you think the same way. I said, Jamin, oops, just told you his name. <laughs> we were talking about this. We said, hey, do, do you feel like in this particular church the, the gospel's being preached? Yeah. Do you feel like you have genuine community? Yeah. I was like, then why aren't you growing? You, you know, your growth isn't to be put as, as a burden on the back of your church. You are a disciple, which is a noun and not a verb. You are di- a disciple, and as a disciple of Jesus, you should be growing if your church is preaching the gospel. You should be growing if you're surrounded by a community of God-like people who are pursuing the heart and mind of Christ together. Like, you can't put that burden on someone else. That's not your church's fault. That's your fault. You got, you got to be growing in godliness that way. Okay, what about steadfastness? And by the way, he's still at that church, and that was a couple of years ago. <laughs> Steadfastness, endurance in difficult circumstances. We press on even when times are tough. It's the courage to continue even when things aren't easy. What about gentleness? You remember we talked about the word meekness to describe David, I think it was, last year? Meekness meaning strength under control. This is what he's getting at with gentleness. It doesn't mean just to be weak. It's weak in the right way. It's to be It's to have strength, but to be able to control that strength and direct it in the right areas. It's kindness even towards difficult people. Like, difficult people you don't want to be kind to. And and maybe for some of us you have the strength to be unkind to them. But you control it and you choose kindness instead. See, when we step into the ring as followers of Jesus, this is what Paul is saying. You are fighting to become more like Christ. When you step into this ring... You are fighting to be righteous and you are fighting to be godly and you are fighting for the faith and you are fighting for love and you are fighting for steadfastness and you are fighting for gentleness. And don't you quit until your heart and your life is formed and shaped by these very things. He says, my first exhortation is flee from the sins of the world. My second exhortation is to pursue the heart of God. But there's a third thing that I want you to see that Paul says here. Flee. Pursue, you might use the word follow. And then third is fight. 
He says this in verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you were made, or which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This is where we get the word fight from. It comes from this particular text right here, verse 12. Paul is painting an image of a runner running a race or of a boxer who was stepping into the ring. This verb here is in the present tense, which means that it's a continuous action. It means that there's not, the, the fight doesn't end until the bell rings, the final bell rings. Some of you think that the moment I got saved, my fight was over, the battle was over. No, the first bell started the fight. That's when you got saved. The last bell finishes the fight. That's when Jesus comes and takes the church home. The time between you coming to Christ and Jesus coming to take you back home is the time that you're in the ring fighting. So if you're here today and you're a child of God, you are in the ring. You are fighting the fight. The word here is the word where we get our word agonize from. That doesn't sound easy. That doesn't sound pleasant. Because it's not going to be easy following Jesus. It's not going to be pleasant conforming into the likeness of Christ. It's going to be tough. But what it describes is a person in the final rounds of the fight because it's a continuous action and he's in the final stretch of this race and Paul is sitting ringside looking at young Timothy while he's taking blows and he's delivering blows and he's saying this, don't you quit Timothy, keep fighting, keep pressing on, don't stop until the final bell rings, the fight is not over, get back up, move on and move on, never, 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 never quit. Timothy's being encouraged by Paul's exhortation to fight. And this morning, you need to be encouraged by Paul's exhortation to not quit and to continue fighting. And I know for you, just like it's been for me, it's not always easy. But we got to keep fighting. Well, what's Paul encouraged, encouraging Timothy to fight for? There's two things that he's encouraging Timothy to fight for. First, he's fighting to defend the truth of the gospel. Paul's saying, Timothy... Man, this world, they are going to hit you square in the face with a different gospel. And you're going to have a black eye, you might have a bloody nose. But buddy, you got to keep fighting. It's not going to be easy, it's going to be stressful, and you're going to lose sleep at night. But you've got to keep fighting. Timothy, the church's unity and the church's purity, which is the second thing, rests on your shoulders of your willingness to not quit fighting. You remember what Timothy was doing at the very beginning of this book? He was packing his bags ready to leave. And Paul said, no, 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 no. I need you to stay there. I need you to stay there because there's false teachers who are infiltrating the church. They're teaching a gospel that's contrary to the gospel of Jesus. And if you leave, that church might not ever see their return to Christ. So I need you to stay there and I need you to fight for the faith. And I don't need you to quit until the final bell rings. So he says, I want you to fight. I love how the book of Nehemiah, we alluded to it a second ago, but if you're in Nehemiah, I love the book of Nehemiah, by the way. But in chapter four, there's an interesting phrase. I don't know, verse 17, I think. There's, a, there's an interesting phrase. It is verse 17, it's on the screen, good job. Um, it, it says this, it says basically they're rebuilding this wall. God's city is being restored. The walls of Jerusalem are being rebuilt. They were destroyed. And God's people were taken into Babylonian captivity. You know all the, the history there. And here they are. They're rebuilding the wall of the city. And the Bible tells us that in one hand, they have their trowel, right? They're, they're trying to rebuild the wall or putting some cement on it. And, and trying to. And then the other hand, they have their spear. P picture that. They're doing the work of God with one hand. And they're ready for the attacks of the enemy with the other hand. Beautiful, beautiful picture because that's a picture of the Christian life. You serve the Lord, and you're faithful to his calling, whatever that might be, and it's not always easy, it's laborious. But meanwhile, you know the enemy is going to attack and not leave you alone, so you have your spear and the other ready for that to happen. What's your spear? It's the word of God. You're ready for the attack of the enemy with the word of God because it is your offensive weapon. We do the work God has called us to do while never growing immune to the pending attacks of the enemy. I love this picture that Paul paints of fighting for the good fight. If I could illustrate it for you, this is what Paul is saying to young Timothy. 
He said, hey, you stepped in the ring when you gave your life to Jesus. You really stepped in the ring when you decided to pastor this church. And he said, and here you are. The, the enemy is going to jab you. And when he jabs you, he's going to try to pull your heart away from the word of God through false teaching. He's going to jab you by pulling your heart away from, a God, from God. He's going to cross you by pulling you away from the church. And he's going to uppercut you to, final, to finally put you down on the ground for your final blow. Ho hopefully never to see you return to Christ. That's what the enemy wants to do to every person in this room. He's jabbing you. Hey, let me just get him away from the word of God. If I can just get him to not read God's word for a few days, that will end up lead leading to a few weeks and then a few months, and then maybe a few years. And when I have him there, I'm going to come with a cross. And when I come with the cross, maybe I can pull him away from the church, and he doesn't see his need for God's people, his need for people to conform and help him grow into the image of Christ. He doesn't see his need for gathering with the saints of God. COVID jabbed us big time. I'm going to, I'm going to jab him, I'm going to cross him, and then I'm going to uppercut him, and I'm going to lay him out. And he might not ever return to Christ. That's the picture that's being painted here. What encourages us then in the fight? This is what Paul says, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession. You came to Christ and you confessed Jesus is Lord. You're the one who chose to follow him. That's the good confession. And then he adds this part. I think it's rather interesting. In the presence of many witnesses. Not only did you come to know Christ and you chose to follow Christ, but you also publicly displayed that through baptism. You showed the world that you were a follower of Jesus. We've been called by God, church family. This should encourage our hearts for eternal life. What does that mean? You are on God's team. God is on your team. God, you and God are together in this. Listen, no matter how many blows you take, no matter how many crosses you take, no matter how many times you were uppercutted, guess what? You, because you belong to Christ, you already know how the fight's gonna end. It's gonna end with you standing up with the enemy on the ground. That's how it ends. When the final bell rings, when Jesus returns, you're going to be victorious. So you can stand in the ring and you can take the blow, you can take the jab, you can take the cross, you can take the uppercut all day long. Why? Because when all this is said and done, you know that you'll reign with him forever. That's the beauty of the gospel of Jesus. So Paul exhorts Timothy, don't quit. Because you know how the story ends. And then he ends by saying, be faithful. Be faithful. Look at verse 13. It says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. By the way, when Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, Jesus stood tall. Remember that. To keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign. Listen to this, guys. This is a beautiful doxology. Who is the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the sovereign one, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Paul says to Timothy, I charge you, Timothy, to keep the commandment until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the fight's all about. You don't quit until the final bell rings. You don't quit until Jesus comes back to take us home. Until then, our job as believers is to fight for obedience. Our job as believers is to become, is to become who we are already declared to be. In Christ. That's what we're doing. We right now as men and women of faith, we are becoming who we are already declared to be as Jesus. Paul is encouraging Timothy to persevere to the end. Listen, perseverance to the end is evidence of salvation. You understand that, right? Perseverance to the end is evidence of salvation. You know people and so do I, right? We know people who were in the church, they they, they seemed like, man, they really loved Jesus. They were on fire for the things of God. And then something happened, and they were no longer in the fight anymore. You know people. They're coming to your mind right now. Where has so-and-so been? Why have they not been in the fight? How have they drifted away? Listen, perseverance is evidence of salvation. What does First John say about this? They went out of us because they were really never of us. Because if they were actually of us, they would have never went out from us. 
And Paul was saying the same thing about the people that you and I know. Hey, the reason they're not in the room anymore is because, or in the fight anymore is because there's no evidence of their salvation. They, they weren't really ever saved to begin with is what Paul is getting at. So they got out of this fight altogether. They quit persevering for the faith. And then Paul concludes like this. He says, the faithful live in awe and wonder of God's greatness. Now, let me ask you, church family, is this where you're at this morning? Are you living in awe and wonder of God's greatness? Look at verse 15, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion forever and ever and ever. Listen to this, church family. He says, blessed and only sovereign. What is Paul saying? He's saying that God alone is sovereign, that he rules over all. That's what that actually means. And then he says that not only is he sovereign and rules over all, but he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is unmatched. He has no rivals. He has no equals. We sung about that a moment ago. He's immortal. That means he's from everlasting to everlasting. He dwells in unapproachable light. His glory and his holiness are so blinding to us that if we stood before the presence of God and beheld his glory and beheld his holiness we would die. It's that beautiful. It's that magnificent. And then he says he's a great God. He's inconceivable and unfathomable and utterly transcendent and all-powerful and eternal. And he says, that's our God, Timothy. That's the one we take blows for. That's the one we get in the ring for. It's for him. It's, to, it's to, so that the world might see how majestic and holy and beautiful and transcendent he really is. So Timothy, I know that the fight that you're in isn't beautiful. And I know that the fight that you're in isn't lovely. But it's worth it. It's worth it. So you keep pressing on. In 2011, Valdosta High School was preparing to play their crosstown rival, Lowndes County High School. They were going into the game together, 6-1, and 6-1. and one. The game was going to be nationally televised on ESPN. Valdosta had not beaten Lowndes County in seven consecutive years. The year before, in 2010, it was absolutely embarrassing. They got crushed. So here we are in 2011. They had a second-year coach, a guy by the name of Coach Rance Gillespie, who's still coaching to this day in the state of Georgia. They go to their pregame speech, and they hear the words, never, 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 never quit. They hear at halftime, never, 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 never quit. It's been embedded into their DNA. If they're seniors, they've heard it for four years. If they're juniors, three years. Sophomores, two years. Freshmen, for a full year at this point in the schedule. Never, 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 never quit. To their demise, it was the fourth quarter that night with a minute and 14 seconds remaining on the clock. And Valdosta was trailing their crosstown rival, the Lowndes County Vikings, 17 to seven. And if you're a spectator, you know what happens in this moment. The winning team, they stays put. The, 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 the losing team, at, with one minute and 14 seconds left, while the other team has the ball, they begin to go home and beat traffic. So that's exactly what they did. One by one, Valdosta High School was filing out of the stadium, getting in their car, and headed to the house. For eight consecutive years, they would take a defeat at the hands of their foe, Lowndes County. It was a three and out, meaning there was three downs. They didn't get a first down, and then they had to punt the football. That also got the ball back. With under a minute and 14 seconds now, they threw three passes. And on the third pass, the receiver caught it, went to go out of bounds, but saw they had an open lane behind him, turned around, heads up midfield, and realized there's no one around him, and he scores a touchdown. It's now 17 to 14, 40 seconds left to play. There's hope on the Valdosta High School sidelines. All we have to do is kick an onside kick and recover it. So that's what they did. They kicked an onside kick and they recovered it. 
Three plays later, they got a first down. They're now about 35 to 40 yards out from scoring another touchdown. They're not yet in field goal range for their high school kicker. They can tie the game. They can win the game with a touchdown. The clock is ticking. They get a first down. They spike the ball to kill the clock. There's about 20 seconds left to play. They decide we're going to throw the ball a few more times to see if we can get it in the end zone. Huddled up on the sidelines, Rance Gillespie looked at them. He said, hey, guys, you don't quit. You don't stop fighting in this game until the final horn sounds, until the final whistle blows. And then he says, you got to believe and you got to protect the football. They would go out two plays later. They would score another touchdown, making it 21 to 17 with only a matter of seconds left to play. Valdosta High would win that football game. Down one with one minute and 14 seconds left to play. That is now an ESPN classic. Every other year, you'll see that football game on ESPN reminding you of what an incredible game it was. But that message keeps ringing in the back of my mind, and I hope it will ring in the back of yours today. It doesn't matter what the optics might be. It doesn't matter if the saints of God start filing out and they no longer support you. You stay in the ring. You keep taking blows. You keep punching back with the gospel of Jesus. You keep being faithful. You keep obeying. You keep pursuing godliness. You keep pursuing righteousness. You keep chasing the heart of God. It doesn't matter if it looks like you are defeated and you're flat on your face. Man, you get back up and you trust that the, the one who saved you will be the one who delivers you. That the one who came and did everything necessary for your salvation is the only reason when the clock strikes zero that you'll be standing victoriously at the end. And I promise you, church family, when you never, 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 never quit, that's when the gospel continues to advance more and more and more and more and more every day. It's not fun, but it's worth it. It's worth it to see men and women, boys and girls, come to know Jesus Christ. Father, we come to you today and we pray that we'll heed your exhortation, that we'll heed your exhortation to flee from sin, to follow after Jesus and pursue you and you alone, to fight the good fight that you have given us in the faith, and then to be faithful unto the very end. This morning, there's maybe someone here today who's quite frankly given up. They've thrown in the towel, so to speak. I pray that today you would remind them that they already have victory to pick the towel back up and to continue fighting. Maybe there's someone here who has not entered the ring. They're looking from the outside not knowing what it's like to be in the inside. And I pray for him and her that she would give her life to you and that she would join us in the fight of faith for the gospel. I pray for us as a church, as we conclude this book, that each individual, that each member of Eagles Landing will pursue wanting to be a healthy church and they'll know, you know what? It's not gonna be easy all the time. There's gonna be days where it's great, there's gonna be days where it's tough. But every day where it's great and every day where it's tough, one thing we can honestly say is it's always worth it. It's worth it because Jesus will shine victoriously at the end. So Father, I pray this morning that you'll get all the honor and all the glory from everything that you want to say and do. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Church family, let's worship together this morning. Would you stand? prayer teams down front. If you need prayer this morning, 